All right, welcome to day one of the USAS overview. Um, I am going to be recording this session and uh, tomorrow and the following day, so I appreciate you all signing in today. Um, but if there is anybody um, at your ITC that couldn't make it, or if you can't make it to one of the following days, we are going to be posting all of the recordings out there. Um, our other housekeeping thing, just to make sure that um, I wanted to mention is that um, I think I sounds like everyone's muted now, so we're good to go there. If you have any questions along the way, the mute button is in the bottom left corner, so you may need to unmute yourself, um, but feel free to do so and ask questions um, as we go through the different pages in the software. Uh, the other thing here is we have um, kind of put together just a quick little agenda for our what our basic plan is um, to look at for the next couple of days. So today we're going to just briefly talk about the home page and then I'm going to go through the core menu and the transaction menu. Um, so we got a lot of bulk of um, stuff here once we get into that transaction menu. Um, and then there, we have a plan to uh, have a break about 10.15. So I'm going to try and keep an eye on the clock and uh, try and hit that so we can have about 15 minutes if everyone needs to um, stretch their legs or that sort of thing. Probably just like a 10, 15 minute break there. We did uh, put this agenda out on um, as a link on like the training sign up page. I believe that is out there now. So, I mean, I know it's really basic, but if you want to reference back to that, um, it is somewhere for you to access. So with that, we'll get going here. I do already have USAS open and I'm signed in. Um, I'm sure all of you have been in here, seen this homepage before. So just a couple notes um, that I wanted to mention uh, first, with the menu um, up top here, we're going to be going through each of these menu options in our training this week um, and talk about uh, what these uh, detailed pages do. We have the report links in the middle of the page and um, these by default will show all the reports that I have access to as a user in the system. Or I can filter this down to only show my favorite reports which don't have any favorited right now, um, but when we get to day three, get to report page, we'll talk a bit more about um, how to make the favorites there. And then uh, also in this top corner here, we have the current period. So right now I'm in February 2020. As we get into talking about the posting periods, uh, this will change. So um, all users have access to see what that current period is um, when they're in the system. That's the other major note I have pretty much with the home screen is that um, as far as what the user can see, all users will see the posting period, but when it comes to these other items, the menus, the reports, that will vary based on the user access level. Uh, so if I have a REC only user, you know, they may only have, they'll only have requisition related reports. They'll only have menu options with items that they can access. So uh, tomorrow I believe Michelle is going to talk more about those different user roles, um, but just as far as the home page goes, uh, make note that we are an admin user right now, so we are going to be able to see everything possible. Our first stop, we're going to start in our core menu, and we're going to go right into our accounts page. And sometimes if I haven't been in these yet today, it takes a bit to load the first time because it's pulling up all of this information. Um, once we start going in and out of pages here, um, then it would load. Um, it usually loads faster the next time because it kind of saves that information um, from the browser. So anyways, once we're in here, um, we see that we have the tabs across the top. I have fund, cash, appropriation, expenditure, and my revenue accounts. Uh, some pages within the software, I know USPS has uh, uses these tabs a bit more, but on the USAS side, off the top of my head, this is the most prominent one uh, where we see the tabs in here. Um, so the fund account is my highest level. It just basically breaks these down to my fund code. On the 
on my cash account. Um, this is going to be my fund special cost center. My fund special cost center and then I can find information um, related to each of these um, account categories basically, um, account groups, full account codes. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to skip over to this expenditure account because we're going to look at some of these different things on the grid and um, just know that um, these same, you know, as far as it goes with the icons that we're going to talk about um, in this grid, it would apply to each one of these different tabs. So I'll save us some time instead of um, making each one load. So what we're looking at here, um, we have a column for each piece of our account code. Uh, we could filter on this. Um, we have icons in the first row that would allow us to view is the eyeball icon. Uh, that will open a pop-up here. We could edit, um, or in some cases we can delete an account, and I'll talk about when we would be able to do that. The other thing we see here, so let's go ahead and use – oops. I'm clicking, <laughs> clicked that on accident there, but um, I'm going to go ahead and filter this down so that we can look at a specific account. Um, so our fund, and as I'm entering each filter, you're noticing my grid kind of narrows it down for me. And let's go ahead and pick one that has an, an amount here. So when I view the account, I can see the account code, um, I have my account information, and then I have the figures that um, apply to the amounts for my account. Um, if there's an initial budget in there, I would see that, um, any adjustments, and then um, my actual expended amount, so anything that's been paid out of this account, and it'll calculate my remaining balance. Once we start looking at some of our reports, uh, we do have um, account-based reports. So if you've ever had us, um, you know, if, you, if you've ever heard that discussed on some of our reports calls, we'll talk about it. Um, the account-based reports are pulling figures literally right from the screen. So when you're looking at a budget summary, that's pulling directly from the expenditure account. Um, let's see, so if I want to edit this account, I could either do the edit icon um, from the top here, or if I wanted to go directly into that edit mode, I could click this edit icon right from the grid. Once you're in edit mode, um, you have just a couple options of things to change. You could change the description. You can add start and stop dates. Um, or if you wanted to make the account inactive, you could uncheck this active box. And then once you make your change, you would just save. And um, then any updates that uh, you made would be saved in there. Also want to note you can clone the account. So if you're making new accounts, um, it may be helpful to clone this current one and then maybe I'm just changing, you know, one thing in here, um, you know, to add some part of um, your account code to update the function, but you want everything else the same as far as the account goes. The other thing we'll talk, to, we'll talk more about when we get to requisitions is this create new and close option. Um, just make note that it's here. This, um, these options appear throughout the different pages in the software when you are um, adding or modifying um, certain, certain pages. Um, that just kind of makes it easier if you're adding in bulk. So we'll, we'll see an example of that later, but just to note that um, those are on that page. So uh, I'm going to cancel out of this instead of making a new account here. And um, that's kind of the basics of this page, you know, create new, edit. Uh, once this gets a little bit more interesting is if we look at the budget adjustments. So again, I'm in view mode. So when I'm viewing, I could click on budget adjustments here and I get another pop-up. 
if there was an initial budget applied here, which this, it had an initial budget run through, well, actually it was imported from Classic, I can see by the description. Um, but once we get into budgeting, you'll see where you can apply those initial budgets. Um, so if that applies to whatever account you're looking at, you would see it in this grid. Um, and if we wanted to add an adjustment, what we could do is create an adjustment right through this screen. Um, my current period is February, so for the sake of this, I'm going to change my date to February. And let's put, let's see, we got 1,000 spent. So let's make a, a $2,000 adjustment here. Whoop. Okay, and once I save, I can close out of this window, and now I see on my account that added this to the adjustments. It increased my expendable amount, and now my remaining balance is updated so it's no longer negative. Now I'm just going to go ahead and open another window. Uh, some of these pages, we'll get into like um, the core of the reports manager and such uh, on Thursday, but as we're looking at some of these pages, I have a couple um, miscellaneous reports that I want to show that relate to what we're doing. So now that we added that budget adjustment, let's just quickly look at the budget transaction report. So that's SSDT budget transactions. This report is basically your summary of any of those adjustments that have been entered. Um, it will also, if you include in your time frame when the initial budgets are dated, it would also be able to include those. Um, so let's look on our query options. It defaults to be for my current period, which is February. So P and D will signify the period. Um, if I go ahead and generate this, I'll get a quick little report showing me any adjustments that are dated within my current period. So both of these were February. I can see the account that was adjusted, the date, um, the description that I gave my adjustment. So in this case, I didn't make it very descriptive, um, but your district might put, you know, I don't know, they may have their own way to put a description. Maybe they want to put, um, a note about like why they adjusted it or who adjusted it, that sort of thing, and then the amount. All right, so let's hop back to the expenditure account here, and let me see. The last uh, little icon here um, that I said we were going to talk about is deleting accounts. Now, if I were to try and delete this account here, do I want to delete? I could just say yes, but it would give me an error. It's not going to let me delete any account that has any activity or any related accounts. Um, pretty much the only time that you're going to be able to delete an account is if they just made it an error, there's no amount associated with it, no transactions associated with it, um, nothing referencing at all in the system. So um, keep that in mind if you know, they want to remove accounts. Uh, the other thing is that if I create, say, an expenditure account, and um, it automatically would create like an appropriation and a cash account to link with it, I would have to delete my lowest level first. Um, I know this is, as far as talking through it, it's not <laughs> the most convenient way, but we have this in the FAQ. I just want to make a note of this um, to mention it to you guys because if, if something like this comes up, um, just know that it, it may be possible to remove as long as there are no transactions. And um, yeah, there's an FAQ I think that talks about this, or you can always uh, let us know. Um, if that's something you're going to do, but just in general, uh, try to delete like the lowest level first. The other thing we can do on this grid is um, add different columns. Um, we have these options up here. Um, I want to just look at the more option while we're on this grid. So generally you want to use the more option before you enter any of your filters because it is going to refresh the page. 
Um, but that's okay, we can put in our filters again. Uh, what this allows you to do is add uh, different pieces that you would see on that pop-up to the grid so that you can see it right from there. Um, I see that I have this ID on here. I'm actually going to take that off. Let's say we don't want to see that. Um, but let's add something like, let's add the forecast line number. When I click the X to um, close out of this More option, it's going to go ahead and refresh my page so that it can update the columns that are showing. Um, most pages don't have these tabs, so you go right to the grid, but on the account page, you do have to click back to the tab. And then if I scroll over here, I can see that I do have my forecast line number. Now I can drag this if I want wherever um, I want that column to show on my grid. Um, I just drag, uh, click, hold, and drag and drop. I can also sort on the different uh, columns by clicking uh, just on the header. So say I want to sort by OPU, I can just click on that OPU and it will sort by that column. I would warn um, if you're using that more option, see I have quite a bit of calculated uh, columns on this expenditure grid. Um, I would definitely warn against this uh, for your districts or even just like to do it with caution. Um, if you have a district that has a very large chart of accounts, if they have a lot of these expenditure accounts, um, any of these figures, they are calculated on the fly. Um, they show on that account pop-up, they're used for reports, but what those are made up of is, you know, fiscal to date expended. This is actually looking, what did I spend this year? What are my transactions adding up to? And it's calculating that to be able to show you the number here. So if I were to go to this more option and just add all of my year to date amounts, that's a lot of calculating that my grid will have to do every single time my user opens this page. Um, so if you have a user that is having loading speed issues with this expenditure grid specifically, that is absolutely the first thing I would check is to um, have them cut down on potentially some of the um, calculated fields or numer like um, amount fields that they have on their grid. If they need to just reset it to the default, they can click this reset button and that would give them um, just the standard. It would basically put the grid back to the standard columns. Uh, the other thing I want to show while we're on this, um, while we're looking at this grid, which again, the more option, the reset option, these apply to all of the grids throughout the software, um, is just to look at a couple different filter options. Um, we saw how we could use the filter on the account code, but let's just do some random filtering here. There are some shortcuts you can use. So first I'm going to take active and put in a T because that will filter it down just to true so I don't have to type out the whole true false if I ever have a field um, for that. And then when I'm looking at my expended amount, um, I could do if I wanted to have a specific uh, figure. So I think I have a 118 in here. We're going to try it. If I put the equal sign and then equals 118, it's looking to only show me any lines that match specifically that amount. There we go. So it went through each one of those, found just my, just the line that matched 118 and now that's what I'm able to see on my grid. If you don't include the equal sign, if I were to take that out, um, by default with um, numbers like that, it would show me that number and anything higher. So that's why I would like to use the equal sign. Um, when we look at the activity ledger, when we're searching transaction numbers, I pretty much always I'm using the equal sign when I'm looking for a specific value, specific transaction number, you know, this specific PO. Um, so that I use it all the time. That one's really handy. The other thing that you can do is use like the less than or um, less than or greater than sign, or you could do less than or equal to. 
so here, let's uh, let this load here. So now I have anything that is less than or equal to, or I'm sorry, just less than 118. If I put, um, if I were to do less than or equal to, then it would include that 118 as well. Um, the opposite of that, I could do greater than, and then it would sort these so it's just anything above that value. And these are listed in the wiki, I believe on the, um, it's under the navigation section, I believe on the grid area. Um, so if you were looking in the wiki, if you want to refer to these values um, later, um, they are listed out there in the documentation. The other one I can do here is um, if I wanted to do a range, so let me delete this out. Um, if I wanted, let's do anything between $100 and then for the range, I'm going to do no spaces. I'm just going to do two periods and then my close and then my final number. So I did 100 dot dot 118. And that's going to search for anything that falls between 100 and 118 specifically um, in that amount field. And again, I probably should have removed some of those other amount columns off of here, but we're rolling with it. Okay, there we go. So. Now I have my quick list of all of these accounts that qualify for that range. And as we can see by using this active and then this expended, I can definitely use, um, you know, multiple filters on my grid here. I could, you know, enter in, you know, pretty much as many columns as I want, um, but it starts narrowing down pretty quickly depending on what you enter. Um, the last one I want to show, I'm going to leave this in here and show um, a like value. And let's see, let's do it on my description. Uh, this little, I think it's called the tilde. It's your little squiggly line that's right um, before the one on your keyboard. If I do that, that means like. So uh, what that is saying is that I want it to just start with this but it doesn't have to um, basically, I don't have to have, type in the entire um, thing. That only works with your text fields. The other thing I can do here is um, our good old normal wild card. So in classic, this was your asterisk, your star. Um, but if I wanted to do a wild card, um, I, do have to uh, that instead of like the like I didn't have to close it this one I'd have to put it on um, the front and the back as far as the wild card this will basically search for anything that's got the this word in it or this text in it um, regardless if it starts or if it's in the middle of that description. So you may need to play around with those but those um, come in handy they can be used in uh, these grids throughout the software. All right, let's switch over to the cash account page. Um, we're going to take a look at some features there. Um, again, some of this is pretty similar. You know, we can view, we can edit. Um, again, if there are no accounts attached to it, we could remove it. Um, let's filter down. And if I view my cash account, I have um, an adjustments option on the cash level, but what I really want to look at here is my mass add option. Now, um, if I click this mass add, what I can do is copy this cash account and all of the accounts attached to it and give it a new special cost center and make a new, um, a new account, a new set of accounts. Um, this is probably something your districts would use at the beginning of the year if they have grant accounts and their special cost center 
you know, maybe it's unique to the fiscal year and now they need to make their new year accounts, um, they would use this option. We have, uh, we're starting with 9001. I would say, all right, let's make, you know, 9021 for next year for fiscal year 21. Um, and then when I submit, it would go through and copy all of the accounts. It would give me a pop up showing me um, that the accounts were created. And um, I'm not going to do this because I don't. Uh, don't know how many account codes are linked to this one and I don't want it to take us too long. So um, it, it's basically as simple as that uh, to create the new ones. The one thing that I will note with that is that the new cash account cannot already exist. So when they're ready to create their new accounts, they don't want to go like create the cash account first and then think they're going to link the new accounts to it. They want to make them all at once with this option. All right, so the, uh, the account code page or the account page, I know that one's kind of a big one. Um, we also hit some stuff with the basics of the grid there. I'm going to start moving down the rest of this core menu. Um, before we move on though, did anybody have any questions that we want to look at on this page? Okay, well, we'll keep rolling through then. Uh, the next one is the bank account. This page, um, the bank account is used when basically printing and processing your disbursements. It comes, um, it comes in with a default bank account record. Uh, and let's actually, let's just look at this normal one. So it has a bank account number. Um, the bank account number is basically just to define between the different records in here. If they have two different bank accounts and they um, want to be able to track their disbursements separately for each, uh, pull them into you know reports or print them in separate runs, then they might make more than one bank account in here. And the bank account number could be like bank account number one, bank account number two. Um, or I have seen districts actually put their bank account number in there. Um, so that can be handy as well. So the system is not going to require them to put like a, you know, an eight digit code in there, nine digit code or whatever, um, but they certainly can. The description, um, again, up to them here. You know what, let me click edit so that we can see these a little bit better. You know, if they wanted to put Huntington Bank in there, uh, that will be used in the drop downs when they're selecting banks. So that might be handy for their employees if they want to update that description. Um, and then the start and stop dates are going to determine when that bank account can be used um, in the system as they're cutting their checks, basically. That last checkbox, um, if they are adding multiple bank accounts in here, that will allow them to set a default bank account. It's going to show green in the grid. And um, when they're doing their processing, that's what's going to show up automatically. So. Um, they wouldn't have to, you know, use the drop down every time if there's a specific one uh, that they normally use. Next, I'm going to hop to the delivery addresses. In my test environment here, I don't have very much in this page. Um, what happens when you guys are importing the district information over is the system's going to look at any delivery address that's used on any existing transaction. So any requisition, any purchase order, and it's going to populate that delivery address into this page. So you may come in here with your district and see a whole list of um, different addresses. Um, generally, this is something that I would suggest to do, you know, when you first get them into the software, um, have them come in here and um, all of the checkboxes in this first column that we see for active will be unchecked. Um, but what they can do is just check the ones that they want their staff to be able to use. And then um, when a transaction is entered um, in that drop down, it'll show only the addresses that they've selected. Um, to be able to make it easy for their staff to use delivery addresses going forward. 
So it's not a page that um, you or your districts will be in a whole lot. Just kind of a housekeeping thing when you get started. We're going to keep kind of rolling right through. Um, OPUs, again, not a page that um, they may be in a whole lot. Um, a lot of this core menu is definitely um, more so like setup items. Um, so this one, it's basically pulling from classic, um, you know, what that OPU, I think it's OPU edit in classic. Um, but either way, it'll pull the OPU code, any description they have entered, and then the IRN that is linked to that OPU. Um, for the most part, these will be defined, but maybe if they have a new building, um, they would have to, you know, create a new OPU. So they would come in here, um, enter their new code, give it a description, and then um, enter the IRN for the building that's associated with. If it qualifies as central office, they have a checkbox for that. And then they just enter that info, click save. The one thing I will say, um, I will make note of here, is that we've had it come up uh, sometimes where they may not have a 000 code defined. Uh, that would generally just be their uh, district-wide IRN. So if that's something, if you find a district that is trying to update something in here, um, they could get a warning if they don't have that 000, and it'll make them add that. Um, that should just be their normal district IRN, um, the district-wide. And so it doesn't necessarily mean they have to use it. If they don't use that on any of their account codes, they just want to create it in here. All right, we're going to keep going right along to the organization. Uh, let me edit this so we can see it a little bit better. Um, this is their basic info. Um, this comes right from the USA Con screen in Classic. And most of this will be populated when you import them in. I do think it's probably a good idea to have them review this information. Um, it is used, you know, in a couple places in Classic, so they may, you know, it's likely up to date, but um, if they have anything that you know they want to update um, this information in USSR is used throughout the software um, as far as like using the report name, um, the address can be used on like the 1099 report. And then at the bottom, um, you'll notice we do have two boxes down there that aren't filled out. So those things don't come over. Um, the central office square footage, the ITC IRN, and they might want to check their IDs. I think if they have them in Classic, generally they come over, but um, sometimes they don't have them in there. Um, so either way, those boxes I would definitely have them review uh, when you import their data. The last two are used for the reporting at fiscal year end. Um, for their financial reporting. So they don't necessarily have to enter that right away, um, but they would want to, they would need to have that entered before they do their financial reporting from redesign. So, I mean, if you're having them review this page when you import their data, you could always just have them enter that information as well. Let's go, um, I'm going to skip posting periods real quick. We'll come right back to that. Let's hit projects. Um, I have quite a few projects in my test database. Um, I haven't seen many districts like in my personal experience that use the projects a lot. Um, but, you know, this comes over from Classic if they were using projects. And basically this gives them a way to track, you know, long-term expenses. Maybe it's over more than one fiscal year. Um, and if they wanted to add a project in here, they would just click that create button. Add their project, add their beginning balance. And then if they had, you know, a start and stop date, they could enter that in. I'm just going to leave that blank for our test.
And what they'd want to do, so we just saved it up. Now it'll be in our grid here. And um, they would also attach it to a cash account. So this little dollar sign here, we would go pick a cash account. That probably doesn't make any sense, but uh, that was my example cash account from the last page. So we're rolling with it. Um, so I would just go ahead, assign my cash account there, and then um, let's view this. And I can see my assigned cash account here. That also shows on my grid. So pretty straightforward page. All right, let's go back to posting periods. So this page, um, just off the bat, we look like we've got a lot going on here. Um, I can see all of my current year posting periods at the top here, my current fiscal year. Uh, so I have my fiscal year column and my month name. These are usually where I'm looking. Um, if I were to scroll down here, I do have a lot of prior periods when the uh, district is imported to redesign. It will look at all of the transactions that exist in um, the classic data and then create posting periods to associate all of those transactions with. So depending on how far back it's been since they purged, um, you know, they may have quite the list here. I do have a date open and date closed column. I can see by most of these columns that from February 21st was probably when this was imported. <laughs> so um, most of those will be stamped, you know, all the old periods with your import date. Um, but as I go, um, when I open new periods, so see March, I opened on March 11th. Um, as they operate in the software, that will give them a way to stamp, you know, when they create it or when they close new periods. I have a couple different ways to tell if my posting period is open or closed. And the first way uh, would be to look at these first two columns. Now I will tell you, um, you will get used to these icons, but I know that they are a little bit um, interesting at first because we have our open folder and then we have our closed folder. What these icons are are actions. So if I look at this folder and then it says open, if I click that, I will make it open. So um, right now July is closed, and if I clicked this, it would open it. Um, I have these two up top. These two are currently open, and if I clicked this, it would close it. And if that doesn't if that doesn't uh, work for you right away, which again took me a little bit, um, what you can do instead is use uh, this open column right here. And if I wanted to see all of the open periods, I could just filter this to true and it would easily show me those. The other thing we get here, let me open this back up, is um, this checkbox is to make a period current. So right now my current period is highlighted in green. I can see that's February 2020, and that's what I'm showing up in my top corner. So February 2020 is current. I can't click the checkbox because it's already current. But if I wanted to make another month current, all I would need to do is check that box. I'm sorry, check that check mark rather, the icon. And now March is current. Um, I'm highlighted green. I have it in the top corner. Uh, deleting periods, you have the um, X icon here. I can only delete a period if it has no transactions associated with it. So pretty much if it's brand new and you just created it in error, then you could remove it, but um, any of those that I'm seeing there have transactions. So if I were to click that X, it, it would actually give me an error. I can't just delete, um, you know, a period that's got, that has things going on, that has um, 
transactions against it or any dates associated with it. If I wanted to create a new posting period, um, I just click Create here, and I would pick the month. I would put in the calendar year. And if I wanted to also make it current at the same time, I can check this box. And that would you know, switch, it, switch me from March to April, um, but I'm not going to do that for this example. So let's just create it and put it out there. So April is created. Um, we do have the checklist for month end that talk about um, taking these steps you know, once they've closed. Uh, that is out under, I think, the checklist in our appendix um, in the wiki. So closing a month, you know, switching to the new month is really easy um, when you're looking at this page in redesign. Okay, let's switch to vendors, our last stop on this core menu. And this is the other big one on the core menu. Um, let's see. So when we come in here, um, I'm going to just resize these columns. This is another thing we didn't really look at on the account page. We looked at kind of you know, moving the columns around. Um, I can also I have this more option so I can add additional columns here as well. If I wanted to add um, you know, their email address or last activity. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, I also have a couple more uh, options up here. The advanced query, uh, this can be used um, basically if you want to filter your grid without having to add specific columns to it. If I click this um, advanced query option, it opens this additional area, and um, this gives me the ability to drag over um, certain items from that vendor record that I can filter on. We do a good example of this at um, calendar year end time because you could use, you could filter basically these 1099 fields. Um, let's see, I'm going to take like text ID number. Um, basically what I would do is come over here and enter in values um, to determine you know, what, how I want to filter my grid below. Do. And then I just click apply query. I was worried about that. So you know what? I should have grabbed screenshot um, for how we sort this. Let's make this a little bit less complicated here. We're going to make it even less complicated. Sorry about this. So if you're looking for um, a thorough example that's a little bit more complex, check out our calendar year end. Um, USAS recording for redesign, that will give you um, a good uh, a full example of what I was trying to do here. Um, and I think there are screenshots in uh, the calendar year and checklist. But for the sake of time today, um, I just kind of wanted to briefly hit this. So we'll do active equals true, and let's apply this one. There we go. So Whatever filters I did put in here once I get the correct values and hit apply, it's applying it to my grid down here. So now I can see these are all active true. I don't actually have to have this column on the grid for this to work. So um, if there are items that you may want to use that for, just know it's available. Um, honestly, this one, it can be a little bit more complex. So uh, you know, as you're starting off, you might not use this right away. Um, so. Yeah, 
Hope I didn't get too crazy with that, but I just wanted to make a mention of it. Um, and I just closed this and it'll go ahead and um, close that up so I don't have to see it anymore. The other thing that um, we should mention while we're just finishing up with these options on the top is the report option. Um, I can click this from any of the grids that has the report option up there. And what this would do is this would allow me to take the information that is in my grid right now and pull it right into a report to print. We'll talk about this once we start looking at the expenditure process. I think there are some um, pretty convenient times to be able to use this in the um, in, in your processing to get kind of like a quick little report. Um, if I want to start with a report on the grid and maybe be able to modify it um, in my report uh, manager later on, I could also give this a name and then save the report definition. Um, and again, Thursday we'll be talking more about reports, but um, just wanted to show that there is an option from this grid. The other thing that you'll be able to do on grids throughout the software is um, if you want sort of a highlight view, um, I know we've looked at using this eyeball icon to actually open up the pop-up, but you can also click right on a line in your grid and get this little highlight view with just some limited columns um, as you go through. So if you're looking at something, you know, that's on here, you know, I'm just kind of going through, that gives you a way um, to be able to see some of those some of those fields without having to, you know, fully open the pop-up. Let's take a look at creating a vendor. So I'm just going to click uh, create at the top here and, um, you know, similar to the account, we get this pop-up where we can enter items in. Um, this one, obviously a bit more complex. We have a lot more information we can enter here. Uh, the vendor number, I can enter a custom vendor number if I want, um, or if I leave it blank, it would assign a vendor number for me. Uh, there's a configuration where we can set up uh, default numbers. Um, that'll be when we get into the systems page. I'm going to give my vendor um, a name. The active box, so this will automatically be checked because of course if we're adding one, we probably want it active. Um, on an existing vendor, it would be as simple as unchecking this box to make them inactive. We have some additional fields here. I'm just going to kind of go through the highlights. Uh, the first one I want to touch on is this default payment type. You have options for check or electronic. Um, I think generally you will be using check, um, at least for, yeah, standard vendors. Um, check is going to, you know, once you actually get to the disbursement page, it's going to signify it to print a paper check. Um, if you are using ACH with a third party, um, then I believe you would also want to use check. Um, basically what the software is because they're using the standard USAS information and then creating the ACH file in that third party, um, they would still need it to be checked so that it can pick up the check number. Electronic is going to be used for your memo vendors basically. Um, if it's marked as a electronic, even, a even if a check number is assigned to it, the XML file isn't going to include the check number, just the reference number. So that's why if you're using the third party printing, um, if they look at the check number um, and then also ACH info, it still may not do anything. So pretty much electronic memo, um, memo check or memo vendors rather, and then check for everything else. These amounts fields, uh, these are grayed out. You don't need to do anything when you're um, creating the vendor there, but um, as payments are issued against the vendor, those will automatically update.
the 1099 section. So this is where I'm going to determine, you know, if this is a 1099 vendor, I would be able to enter in their tax ID number and then um, what type that is. So whether it's a social security number or if it's um, actually an employee ID number. The new hire information, so again, this is kind of just used for reporting. Um, if they do need to be reported, then uh, you would need to switch this to reportable when you're setting up the vendor. You'd enter an ID, any date information needed. And then the uh, reported and the last reported date, those will be automatically updated um, when the new hire report is run. Um, the new hire report kind of works similar to classic. You would um, be able to run a projection and then you would run um, an actual report that could generate a file to be submitted um, for that vendor new hire reporting. And when that's happened, it'll look for vendors that qualify based on their amounts. Um, if they qualify, it will automatically check this box and then update the last reported date. Something that works kind of different with this from Classic is um, you used to have to reset those fields using like, it's like Ven Reset. Um, it was a little program that you'd run at the beginning of the calendar year. Uh, what Redesign does is it actually keeps track, keeps an eye on this date, and when you change your posting period from December to January um, of the new calendar year, it will look at that date and if they haven't been reported this year, it will uncheck this box so that they can be reported in the new year. So you actually don't have a manual step there anymore or your districts won't have a manual step there. Um, if they do, if they are using ACH, um, for their vendors, uh, there's a module that can be turned on. It would add some additional fields um, on this page so that they would have a place to enter uh, the ACH info for the vendor, and then um, that way it could be included on their check file. Um, I also want to take a look at the locations at the bottom here. So we have a little kind of grid area. We can click the plus to add. Um, a location or an address. And I would go through and basically enter um, my address information, go through, fill that out as needed. Um, this last column here, I have check marks for uh, PO, check, and 1099. So if they just have one address, you know, this may apply for all of it, you know, unless they're not a 1099 vendor, but um, you would just check those boxes. If they have a different address that should be used for, um, say, their 1099s, you know, maybe it's their name or something like that, um, then you would be able to just check that separate one um, for their 1099 address. So you would enter you know, as many addresses as that vendor may need in there. Uh, make sure they're designated appropriately, um, and then you can save them within this one vendor. If your vendor in Classic, if their vendor had the 1099 and the colon in the name to field, because um, that was kind of our way to designate it in Classic. It would um, look at that second line if it had um, 1099 listed in it, and then the 1099 program would sort of use that name instead. Um, if you have any vendors that were set up like that, then they will actually import into Redesign and have that location already separated and marked as their 1099 address. So that's kind of cool um, that the system will look at that and bring it in appropriately. Um, I'm not going to save this one up. Let's just go ahead and cancel. Let's look at a normal vendor.
Um, I'm going to go ahead and just view this one. And uh, similar to like on the accounts, we saw if we were in view mode, we could have an adjustment. Uh, we had access to the budget adjustments. When we are in view mode here, we have access to make vendor adjustments. What this will allow us to do is update the come down here. It will allow us to update these total amounts. So I said before that these you know, only get updated when you're making payments, uh, but if there are situations where you need to manually adjust those, uh, say maybe you're merging vendors or there's something at calendar year end you need to correct the taxable amount, these vendor adjustments would allow you to do that. So I would just click to create and I would give this a date. Um, I could give it a description. I'm just making up a vendor number here and saying, you know, say we needed to merge vendors. This should be included in the taxable amount. Um, I want to add $650 on here and then post. So I can see this added it to my pop-up and I could also see that my year to dates all updated by that adjustment amount that I entered. If I made a mistake and I didn't need to do that or um, I did the wrong amount, I can delete that adjustment and it would um, remove it from my totals. All right. So um, that about covers our core menu um, and a lot of our grid functionality. Before we switch over to transactions, are there any questions? Quite a bunch today. I know this is pretty fun. I know we're kind of rolling through a lot of a lot of stuff here, but um, yeah, hopefully um, with these basics, it'll um, it's going to help with multiple pages in the software. Um, you know, all of these grid items will will kind of get going a little bit. We'll roll through these these next couple pages, um, maybe not faster, but in a different way because we um, don't have to hit all of these basics on every page. All right, when we get to the transaction menu, I'm not going to go through this one um, from the top down like I did before. I'm going to kind of hop around here, but we're going to look at this in the context of um, how the pages are used in the expenditure process, and then we'll go back and hit some of the miscellaneous ones um, that don't fit into that after the fact. So we are starting on the requisition page. All right, when I come in here, um, so I have my basic information on the grid, uh, my requisition number, the name and vendor. I can see right from this column with my PO number if it's been converted to a PO basically, um, if I have a PO number attached there. And I also have a converted column that would show me, you know, true or false if, that's, uh, if that requisition has been converted yet. And of course my date. I have my similar um, icons over here where I can view, edit, delete um, if it hasn't been converted yet. And then in the first column I have a new icon and this one is for printing. So if I wanted to um, print this to a PDF or um, to an XML to use with a third party software, I could generate a print file right from my grid. Um, if I wanted to print multiple of these, I could check this box um, and then click to print and it would print a batch. Um, or if I use this check mark up here, it would check everything that's in my grid. 
Um, and that's where what I would probably do is filter this down maybe by date or by converted and then use my checkbox to select just a limited number. I'm going to try this. I'm clicking a lot of stuff here. I see my blue bar at the top, so we might have to wait a minute. Well, just a lesson in that as, yeah, what, since I was, each time I was clicking uh, something over here, it was wanting to reload it. So, yeah, Let's see, I'm hopping over to my second one here and see if I can get this. Okay. Okay, my original page loaded. So, um, so I filtered this down to just show my converted requisitions, um, and then if I enter a date, so um, this is similar to what we talked about with the amounts, where um, unless I enter the equal sign, it's going to give me everything that is that and greater. So if I enter February first, it'll give me anything that's dated February 1st or later. Um, so all of my February requisitions that have been converted, if I wanted to print these, I could just check that box up top. It would select everything in my grid, and then I could print this to an XML or a PDF. And um, if I do it to the PDF, it will just generate me a file real quick here. And so then we can see that we get kind of our basic info. It's using the address um, information from our organization page. I've got, you know, the PO date, um, my deliver to address. Um, so that's set up on the actual requisition. My vendor information, that's using um, the address for um, that vendor that we would have entered. And then our description includes the item information. Uh, which we'll take a look at the specific uh, requisition, entering that in a minute here. And it, of course, I've got a page for each one of these that I selected. Let's go ahead and um, look at creating a rec from, um, from scratch, I guess you'd say. <laughs> The requisition number, uh, kind of like I mentioned with the vendor number, if I leave this blank, it would allow it to assign a requisition number. Um, there is an option in redesign where you can allow the system to assign requisition numbers that start with a certain prefix. Uh, like maybe, you know, it's going to be my user's initials and then their uh, the next number available in their pattern. So that is set up on the user page, and um, tomorrow when we get to that page, we'll talk uh, more about those fields. But at this point, just know that that is definitely an option. My date is going to default to my current date. Um, I can select a vendor in here, so I'm just going to select a random one. If they wanted to enter a deliver by date, um, and then you have some of these um, kind of standard fields that you saw in Classic, terms, attention, type um, is available. And then we have uh, check boxes, so converted. That once we actually convert this requisition, that will automatically update multi-vendor. Uh, this is not something that you would need to manually check. Um, multi-vendors, you don't have an actual vendor for anymore in redesign. Um, in order to make this, per or, I'm sorry, in order to make this requisition a multi-vendor, what I would do instead is simply leave the the vendor field blank. So if I just left this blank, saved my requisition, 
it would check this multi-vendor um, box. If they had multi-vendors in Classic, um, they'll come in to redesign uh, the actual vendor itself from Classic will come in um, as inactive. So just kind of a note there. Um, and so let's pick a vendor again. And then when we actually go to enter our items here, we just click this plus. It's going to give us a line. It's going to open up a line so we can enter our information. Um, quantity, I would enter a unit. So kind of same as classic. They could do like each. It's that's a kind of a custom field, you know, that doesn't have like a specific requirement. They could leave it blank. Let's get some pencils. Um, and we'll say $5 each. Now, um, I'm kind of tabbing through. They could click through here. Uh, that's kind of on preference. Um, but I do want to mention when we get to the accounts that uh, we could enter this account a couple different ways. Um, first of all, the basics. If we just want, if this is going to one specific account, I could start typing it in here. And as I type, it will pull up my little drop down. Um, kind of go from there. The other option that was added, uh, this makes it a bit easier, especially for somebody who may only be in here doing requisitions, um, if that's their extent of using the software. Uh, they may not know the whole code in order to start typing it in with the dashes. So instead, um, I just clicked this magnifying glass icon and I would be able to come up here and I could put in Um, just whatever pieces of the account code that I wanted. So see I put in fund 001, object, I just put in an 8, but I still get all of these that start with an 8. I could also search on the description. Um, so if they know that it's a supply account, I, I use those wild cards, but um, if I enter that in, then any description that has supplies in it is showing up here. And when I find the account that I want, um, basically what I'm going to do is just click on this line and it's going to populate that account there. Populate it into um, the account used for the charge. Another thing to note there, um, there is a way to filter down the accounts that each employee can see. Um, again, that's in the user page, so we'll get there in detail, but just as we're looking at this, um, you know, if they do have an account filter applied to their user account, then when they do that pop-up, it's going to not, you know, it'll only show the accounts that they have access to, so that will also kind of help narrow down what they're looking at there. They, you know, may not have that big list like I was looking at as a full access user. The other thing that they can do here when it comes to the accounts is we have these two little icons. We have um, split, by, split by quantity or split by price. Uh, let's start with split by price. This, is only, this one only highlights if you have a quantity of one. So if we open this up here, I can see, all right, this found my first account. Um, if I wanted to add another account to split my amount here and say $3 of this is going to my first one and uh, $2 to my second one, and then I would just pick another account here, and I can see my total is still $5. And, um, you know, when I save this, it would... Here, I guess we'll do this. Um, when I save this and then close, now I have my one line item split by price to um, two different accounts. If I want to add another line item, I have a plus here or here um, on a really small rec like this. It doesn't really matter, but if you start getting a lot of line items, it might be nice to be able to just use that add item within your grid. And let's add a bigger quantity here.
All right. So um, adding 10 boxes of pencils, and um, if I click this little kind of link icon, uh, this is where I can split. Let's do half and half here. So five of those boxes I want to my first account. And again, I'm just kind of picking randomly here. Um, so five boxes I want to my first account, five to my second account. Um, that will allow me to split this on the same line item. And there we go. I also have this copy icon. So um, these two little pieces of paper, if they are uh, wanting to just copy one line item, have the same thing here, and then uh, maybe just change, you know, this one's only going to be one box. That may be an easier way to add line items to some of their bigger um, transactions. All right. I can see um, now that I have all of my line items added here, I have a requisition total that's up at the top of my um, amounts. And oh, and I also promised I would talk about this create new and close option. Um, so we saw this, we actually saw this on the vendor page too and the accounts. Um, before I save, if I check this box for create new and then save, what that's going to do is open me up a new requisition to make. Um, if I click close and then save, it'll close my window, take me back to the grid. Uh, basically what those allow you to do is just kind of speed up the process. If you're entering uh, multiple transactions, um, you know, the close is kind of, if I didn't have anything checked and clicked save, then I'd also have to X out of this window. So it kind of just saves that extra step. Um, so let's see this in action. Oh man, you know what? One more thing we'll show. Let's show deleting line. So um, this one, because I didn't update my split accounts, but I changed the quantity. So let's just go ahead, delete that extra line item, get back to our two, and then now we'll save. There we go. Now that purchase order that, or I'm sorry, that requisition that I made is saved. What I'm looking at now is it's here and ready for me to create a new requisition. So I could just go right into it, add my info here, click save, and it would give me a new one. So if you have somebody that's entering multiple in a row, then they may really like that option. And um, actually, I'm just going to uncheck these. Let's cancel out of this because one is enough for now. And um, go back to our grid here. Now I have this filtered down to, you know, converted my date. Let's just take all of that out and let's look at only the ones that are not converted. Um, and we can convert some of these into purchase orders. So I did converted false. This regardless of date is still just showing me um, anything that um, is available to convert. And this is where it may be helpful to get kind of a quick report. So if I wanted to, um, get a report of these requisitions that are on the grid. Maybe I'm cross-checking this to, you know, the list of recs that I know are approved. Um, just go ahead and generate here. I'm going to go right to PDF. And this just gives me a really um, just kind of cut and dry report of what I'm seeing on my grid. When I go through that list, you know, maybe I know that uh, these um, three recs are uh, available, you know, these are approved, these are allowed to be converted. So I could just check those three. And then at the top here, I have the option to convert. That's going to allow me to enter a specific PO date. So when I make these purchase orders, if I want them all to have today's date, I could enter that in. Um, otherwise, it's going to um, use the requested date on the PO. Or I'm sorry, on the requisition. Also, the starting purchase order number. Um, 
I can enter that if I have a specific um, series that I wanted to start on, or if I leave it blank, it'll use my configuration to assign purchase order numbers. Um, so let's post this. And I get a little pop up here. I can see my results. So I have um, all three that I chose were converted successfully. I didn't have any failures. And then um, I have some warnings here as far as negative balances. But um, now these are available as purchase orders. And here's my, my PO numbers. So next we'll go ahead and look at these purchase orders, talk about um, the details on that page in that grid. But we have hit about 1015. We're one, one minute late here because we were converting. Um, but let's take um, just under 15 minute break. Let's uh, start back up at 1030. All right. All right, so we've hit 1030. So um, let's go ahead and keep rolling here. Um, let's see, so we stopped at our convert uh, after we converted the requisition. So I'm just going to close out that page. And um, next we're going to switch to the purchase order um, page. And when I converted those requisitions, um, it made the purchase order. We're going to be able to go look that up um, on this grid. And I can see it's actually the top one on my grid right here. I can see by the date. So uh, since I didn't enter in a date, it kept that date of 317. And um, let me go ahead. Uh, we'll talk about our new icon here in a minute, but let's just start out by viewing um, the information from this requisition that, um, that we converted. So um, it did assign a PO number automatically came over with the same purchase order date as, um, as what my requisition date was, my vendor, delivery information. Um, and again, I'm just going to click Edit to, so that some of these fields are a little bit easier to see. I'll notice I do have a source field now. Uh, this one, basically this is the requisition number uh, that was assigned um, to my rec, and that's going to show as the source. I have a couple other uh, date, fields, date fields here as well. I have a created date. Um, you'll see there's a modified date field and a posted date. So the difference between these fields, um, my main purchase order date, so that you know, is the date that I've stamped it. That's um, the date that's used for when my encumbrances um, basically were added to my books when this amount was encumbered. Um, the created date though is when it was actually entered. Um, I could have, you know, maybe put this purchase order, I could have given it a future date. Um, 
now that I have April out there and open from my posting periods page, I could have dated this um, purchase order in April, but it was still created today. So that created date will reflect the actual date that I made the PO. If I do uh, edit something um, or amend something on this PO, my modified date would be updated. And then the posted date um, is actually used for integrating with third party applications. Um, this field will uh, automatically be populated either with the created date for new purchase orders like we're seeing here, um, or if it's modified, then it would um, be overwritten with the modified date. So really nothing that you need to uh, do within the software normally for that posted date, um, but just a note on you know, how that's used. We also see some more checkboxes here. So we had our multi-vendor that would have um, popped up when we were making the requisition, but we also have invoiceable. And this one is again also automatically updated. Uh, basically what that means, if it's checked for invoiceable, it is open. You can post invoices to it. Once this PO is paid and closed, then that will be unchecked and it will no longer be invoiceable. The then and now flag, um, that one again automatically updated. So when this is invoiced, um, depending on the date that is used um, for the invoice compared to your purchase order date, um, if it qualifies as a then and now, then the system would automatically update that checkbox. And then the amended flag, if you do have to amend a PO, um, then that would automatically be checked if this is amended. Now I am in edit mode so that we can see everything on here. This is a brand new purchase order that I just made. So when I'm editing, I can see you know, all of these fields that are available to be able to edit. Um, but let me cancel so that we can look at amend. Um, Edit can be used as long as the purchase order is new, so it's not been paid on, and it's in um, an open period. As soon as I close the period, say it's the PO is from last month, now I'm in the new month and I've closed that period, then I use the amend option. And that amend option is basically a more limited version of edit. So there are certain things that they can't change um, when they're in the amend um, option. And if you are, say, in a new period from when that purchase order was created, um, that may be necessary to preserve uh, you know, what the encumbrance amount totals were for that prior period now that it's closed. Um, so if you have to amend, you know, maybe the um, purchase order has been sent to the vendor, or maybe that period is closed, or maybe it was paid on, um, this is your limited view of what you'd be able to update here. So the vendor you wouldn't be able to update um, because generally you would, this would be after you've sent it to the vendor. And then um, the account codes and that sort of thing. You can add a new item. So if you needed to change an account code on a line item, uh, what you would do instead is cancel the original. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's copy it first. And um, I would then cancel the original line item with those original accounts. And um, let's change this maybe to – we're going to change it so it just comes out of one. So maybe that's the amendment we need to make is we you know, didn't want this to actually be, actually be split um, to multiple line items. We just wanted it to be – or to, I'm sorry, to want multiple accounts on that one line item, we just wanted it to be charged all to one account. So I removed the original line, added the new one, updated that, and then I could um, save from here. I have some warnings for negative amounts on my accounts, um, but it does let me save that, and then that's updated. Uh, let's see. Um, 
outside of just looking at the actual PO, so if I wanted to print um, purchase orders, you know, say I wanted to print them from a specific uh, batch or starting, you know, at a specific time frame. So again, I could do, could filter this to just show anything from, you know, February 1st and later, and um, then I could print. If they do print these through a third party software like Edge, um, maybe they want the XML file instead of a PDF um, because that would be able to go into the third party software. So that basically replaces the DAT file that they um, may have used to use. And then you would just click print. The other thing that I can do on this page is I could choose a purchase order to invoice right from here. Um, so that's our new icon over here. This one in the first column is the ability to create an invoice right from this grid. Now, when I'm clicking the invoice, um, what it's doing here is it, it's pulling up my view to create the invoice, but on this step, um, when I do this, it is also switching me to my invoices page. So let me just drag this down for a minute. And you know, I should have pointed this out as we were going through some of these other pages, but in the top left, I can always see what grid I'm on because it's always noted. So I started off on the purchase order when I clicked that icon, switch me over. Um, but it pops me up the page where I can go ahead and invoice this. Um, I do have to give it an invoice number. So um, you can type that in or I have my handy list from obviously I've been in here before <laughs> and uh, shows me my PO number here. Um, I have the date will default, but I can update this if I want to. Um, and then I have a couple more date fields. I have my normal invoice date. I have the vendor invoice date and I have a payment due date. Now for the difference on these, the invoice date is what the system is going to use. So that's just date, this first one. That one's going to um, basically look at my posting period um, in my top corner, figure out how to account for this transaction in the system. The vendor invoice date, um, this is basically what they want to use if um, they're used to actually looking at the paper invoice and they like to change the date um, to whatever date is on their paper invoice. If they do, um, if your districts use that in their normal process, um, I would suggest that they use this field to enter that. The payment due date, um, so that one, maybe if they're entering multiple invoices, you know, and they want to be able to filter on when that's due or when they want to cut the check, um, they could enter a date into that payment due date. And then that is actually added to our payables grid that we'll look at. Um, and that gives them a way to filter down um, which payables that they select to post and make checks, make checks for. From here, um, I can see all of my line items on here. I have my um, to cancel, well, this is um, part of that uh, split item, but I have these canceled ones that I can see are grayed out because I you know, took those off of my PO with my amend option. Um, but I can still kind of see what's there. And if I wanted to fill these, I could come in here and um, you know, check my items, go ahead, click to fill, and then that would update my amount, my item status. I do have a received date that I can enter, um, but if I leave that blank, it will default to my um, date that's up here. You know what, let's fill this one too. Um, if I didn't want to just click fill, I could also, you know, come type in here. And then, um, pick a status. Uh, 
um, and update that. So um, they can click through here, they can tab through here. Um, and once you are done updating that, you would go ahead and just click Save. And it will save my invoice, add that to my grid. Um, I do have, if, if you're entering multiple invoices in a row, I do have an option right here to go ahead and enter my next invoice number, you know, and then create, I could click create to make a new invoice. If the current PO that I was paying on, if I didn't fill this and it was still invoiceable, that would automatically populate here so I could just um, create another invoice right away if I wanted to. The other thing I can see once I'm in this, I'm in um, like the view of my invoice now. Um, I see this action option in the last column. What that will allow me to do is if I did need to reopen this invoice, um, as long as my invoice is in an open period, I could come in here and click my action to change it from full to partial. And that would reopen my last line item, so maybe I could pay on it again. And then actually I can see right up here, it put my PO number now that it's open, and I could go ahead and create, you know, say a separate invoice for that um, if I wanted to. Um, the other thing that you can do if there is, um, let's go back to our purchase order page real quick because I just um, want to show how to cancel one. Um, so let's pick one of these. I think we probably have, yeah, this one's still open. Okay. Um, so I have, let's just type in. Um, if you have an, a PO, still has a remaining amount on it, um, but you want to close it and say, uh, you know, you haven't paid on it. Well, I guess it depends. If you haven't paid on it at all, um, you could technically still potentially amend. Um, but if it's no longer in an open period, um, or maybe if it has a payment and you're just canceling the remaining amount, then um, we looked at filling the item here, but you also may um, use this cancel status. Um, so that's basically what I want to show here. Cancel full. Um, and then if you have the amount entered in there, I could save this. This would close my PO so that it's no longer invoiceable. Now, we're just kind of doing an overview today, so I don't want to get too deep into this, but there are situations, um, you know, kind of depends when you would or wouldn't use this. Uh, this is something that we've seen kind of used in um, one of the new situations that we're seeing with, um, you know, when you import. So keep an eye out for that in the documentation. Um, but I just kind of wanted to show at least what that status looks like so that as you go, if that's something that you have to use, um, at least we got the basics. All right. So um, now I'm on my invoice page, and let's see. Um, so now that I've got my items invoiced, yeah, the next place that we're going to go is to the transaction um, payables page. Um, your user, they can go in there, create all their invoices. This is the page they could view and edit them. Once they switch to payables, this is basically like their holding area. This is what's queued up in order to be able to be posted um, as a disbursement. So my cancel, my cancel invoices won't show up there, only anything that I've um, set up as partial or full. And once I'm in here, so I have um, I have another one that where I have different tab options. 
My first tab that I'm on here is called Vendor. Uh, basically, this is kind of my simplified view of what I have queued up to pay. I have two different vendors um, that have amounts that have amounts invoiced for them. Um, I have this Lake Park Cafe, and then I have the Norcross Office Supplies. Um, I see this is my 205, so that's the one that I invoiced. So I already had that Lake Park um, Cafe sitting out here um, as an invoice that has not yet been posted in my test environment. If I know for sure that I only want to post um, my invoices from this one vendor and this is the right amount, um, I could definitely check this box and post right from here. If I want to see additional information on um, the invoices that are making up you know, these amounts, then I would be able to go to this Detail tab. And this gives me um, a much more detailed breakdown. I can see um, the different amounts for the line items. I can see the invoice numbers that those are each associated with and who posted them, um, and also the POs that they were posted against. That last column is for the payment due date that I mentioned um, you could enter on the invoice, so I don't have a payment due date entered on any of these. Um, but if that's something that um, the district enters you know, on that invoice, then that would show up um, by default on this grid. And what I can do in this case, so say I, you know, I do want to post all of um, that, you know, full invoice that I had just created, but maybe I want to post, you know, one of these other invoices that were out here before. I can pick and choose using my check marks which one of these, you know, which ones of these I want to post. And then when I'm ready, I would click post selected. Before I actually confirm this, I get a little summary here, and um, I'd say this page um, definitely something that um, your districts will be verifying um, at this point in the process. I have two vendors that I'm posting from, so that was my Lake Park Cafe and my office supplies, and then three different invoices. This is going to be my total check amount, or my total like amount that I'm yeah I'm posting for checks. My disbursement date, um, so that's going to be yeah what, what my disbursements are actually dated. Uh, if they want to update that here, they can. Um, again, it has to correspond to an open period. This is where I see the bank account. Uh, so if I had a different bank account to associate with these disbursements, then I would be able to update that, um, or it would just show there. And then the grouping options. This is this is pretty much the big one for this page is when I create these disbursements, do I want them to be grouped by vendor? So do I want um, two checks, one for this vendor, one for this vendor, one, you know, one for Lake Park, one for um, the office supplies, or do I want to group them by invoices? Now what that means is that I would get three different checks, three different disbursements um, because I have two invoices for the Lake Park Cafe uh, vendor. Um, especially when districts are going through their uh, dual processing phase, if they're doing check runs, that could definitely be important um, depending on how, that they've, how they've grouped or created their um, checks in Classic. So um, just keep that option in mind. So let's group by vendor. So we're going to go ahead and get two disbursements, um, and then I'm going to post this. And um, this part can take a minute. We're just doing um, a handful of records, so it'll probably. So you know, we went pretty fast here, but um, if they're doing really big check runs, you know, you may need to give that page a couple minutes to process. Um, and right from here, I could actually continue to print. And this is, again, another one where it's going to actually switch the page for me. Um, so 
this one probably takes a minute as well. Yep, we're loading. And um, it's actually going to switch me. I'm currently on payables, but we're going to move over to the disbursements page. While this is loading, um, before we get into the disbursements, do we have any questions about that part of the process? All right, quiet bunch. All right, we'll just give this another minute then. Oh, there we go. Okay, so once we are um, once we're switched to this grid, um, again we have a lot of information here. We can see uh, by the date. Um, and if I click on the header, it's going to sort it. So uh, we can see by the date. So I dated both of my disbursements the 17th. So those are right there at the top. Um, I have my vendor information, uh, my amount. And I can see though that I don't have a check number assigned yet. Uh, that's one step that I'm still going to have to do on this page. Um, but I also have um, options to look at, you know, other disbursements reconcile date, the status, um, and then whether they were printed or not. When I'm actually in the process of doing this, uh, like check run this expenditure process, uh, the easiest way when I get to this page to kind of narrow it down is to click this checkbox for show printable. This will immediately um, get me down to just the disbursements that need to be printed or the checks that would still need um, a check number assigned. So let's uh, just continue with our two here. And um, if we want to complete this process and get the check number, get the file that we can actually print our checks with, um, we would do this generate print file. Now on my pop-up, again, uh, just like with my other pages, I could enter a starting check number. If I leave this blank, I can see my highest check number on file. If I leave it blank, then it'll just go ahead and um, assign the next available number. My sorting options, this is going to determine the order uh, that I see my checks in my print in my print file, but also the option or the sort order for which they'll be assigned check numbers. Um, that's another big one when your districts are uh, processing in dual is to make sure that they're choosing the same option, the same sort option to assign their check numbers in redesign as they are in classic if they're doing parallel check runs. So I'm going to leave this as vendor number. Um, print electronic checks. So if I did have um, any vendors that were marked as electronic or any memo vendors and I wanted to um, include them in my print file, then I would check this button, check this checkbox rather. And then my output type, so XML is what I'm going to use if I'm um, sending this over to um, Edge or another printing software, just any like third party print software to create a check as another one, um, or PDF if I actually wanted to get a PDF version of those checks. And then from there, I'm just going to go ahead, click generate, and this will just take a minute um, to make the file. My file pops up in um, my browser down here, so I could save that um, and move it to whatever folder uh, needed to print. Um, now my two disbursements that I chose to print are no longer on this because I'm still just showing the printable ones. So let's uncheck this. And I can see that my two um, check numbers were assigned here. So that's the basics of my expenditure process from requisition to check. Um, I do have additional things that I can do on this disbursements page uh, once the check's cut. 
uh, you know, we see that there's a reconciled date and a status here. So once this clears the bank, I may want to reconcile this check. Um, I would just check this box um, or I could check multiple and uh, click to reconcile up here. I can give it a date. And then that will give me um, information. Okay, so one out of one was uh, reconciled. If you were running, if you were doing multiple and for some reason one didn't um, update, it would let you know. And now I can see the change to uh, my status and my date stamped on there. Um, I also have an unreconcile option. So if for some reason I needed to um, update that check or maybe it shouldn't have been reconciled, I can just as easily click to unreconcile. And just as simple as that, I'm back to outstanding. Um, auto reconcile, there's a configuration option um, that will kind of, I think that's in, uh, let's see, it's in the utilities. So we'll hit that on, um, remember if that was on day three. Um, probably just briefly, I don't know how much that's being used right now, but uh, basically auto reconcile if you if you have a district that gets a file from their bank um, that's in sort of like a standard format, and then um, they upload that so that it would just automatically know which ones have been reconciled without them having to manually do it. Um, so that's what that is for, but um, yeah, again, there's a little bit more setup with that one. Um, Void, if I needed to void checks, I could also do that right from this grid and just choose one of these. Um, if I were to choose a void, so again, I get a pop-up. It shows me the void date. And then I have this checkbox for void the invoice items. Now, when you used to void a check in Classic, it would always void the invoice items. You would void the check, it would take you back to the PO, and then you would have to invoice again if you wanted to um, like update that, uh, if you wanted to like repay it basically, you're, say you're recreating a check. Um, what this allows you to do, so if you leave this exactly how it is, it would work the same way as like the voiding classic. Um, but if I don't want to void the invoice items, if I uncheck this, what this allows me to do is um, void just the disbursement, but still have this show in payables. Um, the invoice would still exist. And then that way I could go back to the invoice and maybe just modify it instead of having to create a brand new invoice. Um, this really comes in handy if it was a really big invoice or maybe there were multiple invoices that went into that disbursement for the vendor. Um, I've seen a lot of situations where this is just much more convenient than them having to redo um, every invoice that was associated with one specific check. And then once you decide, you know, if that's the option you want or not, you just go ahead and click confirm and that would void your disbursement and stamp it with a void date. Not going to void this one, but I do have one down here. Uh, that we can look at. So here's a voided um, check. It'll stamp with the status and a void date so that it can be um, pulled on reports. And if you do ever need to change the void date, um, once you're viewing that um, transaction, you do have this option up top to change that void date if needed. Now, if you're going to use that option, um, the date that it currently is and the date you're changing it to, the posting periods for both of those need to be open. Um, but you would basically just click change date and then update that void date field and click save. And simple as that, 
um, it's changing your void date. That may be relevant um, if you're looking at like an outstanding disbursement report for a certain month, um, trying to balance there. So that void date could impact, you know, whether or not it shows on certain reports depending on when it was voided and what month it was created. Um, so there, yeah, you may not need to change the void date that often, but there are some specific situations where that definitely comes in handy. The last, um, the last one I want to talk about on this page is the resequence option. Let's grab a couple of these here. Um, so resequence we have at the top. Um, again, we get a pop up here. This it is tied to a specific bank account, um, just because when you're um, it basically kind of how when you generate your um, your checks, it links it to a bank account. Um, but what we really want to focus on here is our original start and end number. Um, and actually, I checked my boxes so you could see them, but really what it's going to go by is not my check transactions. It's going to go by um, what I enter in this box here. So let me see. And I'm so, I apologize if it's kind of blurry when I have that pop up there. I think it's my um, remote connect on my machine. So I'm just going to have to jot down my numbers real quick because I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing them when it's grayed out. Okay, so let's do this. Let's resequence. Again, doesn't necessarily matter if those are um, checked or not because we're going to enter our start and end numbers in here. And then what we're going to do, so my start number was my first check, my end number was my second check, so that's going to include both. It's, it kind of works like a range. Um, if you're just changing one check, then you would enter the same check number for start and end. Um, and my new start number, so let's say, um, one more zero and try and make sure that's not used. I can validate this before I actually post it to make sure that my number is not used or it's not going to be any problems. Um, okay, cool. So that um, shows that it's validated um, and I won't have any problems once I post this. Um, before I actually do that though, I do have this option right here to void the old check numbers. Um, if I do choose that option, that means that these option or these um, check numbers cannot be used again. Um, kind of just depends on the reason that you're resequencing. Uh, if um, you know if you're trying to just correct the numbers or free them up, uh, change your series, you may not want to actually void the old check numbers. Uh, there are some situations where you may want to, if there was a destroyed check or something like that. Um, then you may want to use that option. But for now, we're just going to leave that unchecked and go ahead and post this. And I get my little um, confirmation message, and now my check numbers have been updated. Alrighty. Okay, so I think we've hit everything there. Uh, so we're looking good. Um, let's go ahead and hop to um, cover these other pages that aren't specifically a part of this core process. Uh, the first one I'm going to switch to is the activity ledger, and this will give us kind of a good um, a good overview actually of what we just did. And you know what? I should have written down my PO number though. We might have to go stop. Oh, there we go.
Um, so once I get to the activity ledger, this is um, kind of like your um, oink replacement or, you know, maybe um, similar to like a use SDW lookup um, with the information that's currently in the system. Um, but this is basically just a super powerful lookup tool. Um, let's start by looking at this, uh, any transaction associated with this purchase order that we just made. Um, so let me go ahead, enter, I did my equals because I want to look at just this specific PO number. Once I filter this in here, um, I can immediately see a couple of things. My type column shows me the type of transaction, my date, um, I did all of these on the same date since we're doing this today, but if you had sort of a progression where, you know, the purchase order was made, it was invoiced a week later, the disbursement was cut, that would be um, helpful to see um, sort of your dates there as the transaction went through uh, the system. And then I have my different line items. So if I wanted to focus specifically on one line item, I could also filter this down and see purchase order, invoice disbursement. I have my account codes that I can look at on this grid um, along with a lot of other items that I could add under that more option. Um, basically this compiles your PO, your invoice, your disbursement, your receipts, um, your transfers. It compiles all your different kind of transactions into one place um, for you to look up. Um, the other example I have here, so say we want to look up um, just one type of transaction, so we could narrow this down to POs, and then we could also enter a date range in here. So I'm going to do the first of this calendar year, and then again, my two dots like we looked at on the account page is a range. Um, so if I just wanted everything from January 1st through February 1st, I can enter that date range in here and I'm only looking at purchase orders. So this would give me a really quick list of all of these purchase orders. Um, it shows my line items individually so I can see the specific amounts charged to each PO. If I scroll over here, I have a remaining encumbrance on that. Um, so really, you know, if you have, um, balancing, you know, if you're trying to locate a certain amount for balancing and you kind of have a specific um, month that you're looking for, a specific account that you're trying to tie transactions to, uh, this is a really good way to be able to see all of that activity in one place. Um, Yeah, the other thing I could do is um, let's look at, let's put our purchase order back here. I'm going to take out our date range and say we wanted to see um, all checks for a purchase order um, without having to run a specific report for that. Um, so obviously, you know, this is um, pretty much just our one uh, check number um, and we have a couple different uh, line items here. Let's see. Yeah, so um, basically we could pull up all checks for this purchase order and then if we did want to take that to a report, we could go ahead and just get a report right from this grid um, for that. Um, another example uh, that I'm just going to mention. I feel like we've kind of looked at a couple different ways to uh, filter this down, but the other thing to think about is that you have the vendors on here. So if I wanted to see, you know, all disbursements for a specific vendor, actually, I guess I am going to filter this down. Sorry, I lied. Um, so now disbursements. Here's my vendor number. So I can see all checks associated with this vendor. And, um, you know, I have my date. So if I also wanted it to be for, you know, the current fiscal year or something like that, I could easily um, see this information. Let's do. 
So only the check I just cut was paid within this current fiscal year to the spender. And I hope I didn't fly through too fast with all of the things that we could look at there. Um, but really, I think that the point is just this grid is super powerful. Um, you know, these are just a few of the examples of things that you can use this grid for. All right, the next place we're going is to the receipts grid. And again, we kind of have our basic information here, um, our receipt number, date received from, and we could edit, view, or print any of these existing records. Let's look at creating a new transaction. I have my create new and close option. So if I need to enter a handful of receipts, I could check create new so that I can um, kind of keep getting new windows as I go. If I do close, it'll close this window up um, when I click save. So let's, we'll let's click that for now. Um, receipt number. Same thing, uh, we could enter one or if we leave it blank, it will default. I've got my date field and then my received from and my description. So, um, you know, I, if I had somebody specific I needed to put in or, you know, if I wanted to make a note where I received that from, um, I had a description. And then um, I would just add my items at the bottom here to be able to um, enter my received amounts. Now I do have a type field here. Um, RC is going to be an actual receipt that will use a revenue code um, or an RX is a reduction of expenditure. And so that would apply to an expenditure account. So we'd choose our type, we'd pick our amount, and then again, we have this drop down. Um, we could uh, pick an account this way, or we also have our account search option where uh, we could enter in a fund um, and then go ahead and let's pick lunch. All right, so we'll pick our account there. Um, I can add a line item or I can copy this one. And then I can also, if I want to mix up the type here and add a reduction of expenditure entry, And then when I search here, now see how my account um, is kind of expanded? Oops. Because I have these other fields, these are my expenditure accounts now that I'm able to come in here and select. There are some rules in place. So, you know, if you were to try and change these, um, once the account selected, we have some safeguards in there. Um, so that you know the appropriate account pops up with the appropriate type. And then once I've got everything entered, I'll go ahead, save this. And it closed my page for me because I had selected close instead of me having to manually close it. Um, and then now this pops up on my grid. Um, again, I could you know print single or if I wanted to print multiple, um, I have a print box up there to print my receipts. Um, and I could 
um, you know, view this, clone it. I have a reverse option. Um, so pretty standard on this page. Um, a lot of these transaction pages, once we get to looking at them, uh, they're pretty consistent as far as um, the actual processing and entry portion. I'm going to roll right over to refunds. Um, we're going to see something pretty similar here. So I just kind of want to um, brief through these pages. Again, I um, hope I'm not going too fast here. So if you guys have questions on these, uh, please feel free to speak up. I just don't want to be um, too redundant with some of these ones that, that kind of look the same. Oh, I do have a question. How many characters can be entered under the description on the receipt? Um, I don't know that there is a specific limit. Uh, let me see if I can check real quick since this is loading. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a specific uh, character limit on that description. Um, I think you can potentially like apply one. There's rules that can be written in that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll have to check on that. I'll let you know, Susan. I'll, I can send you a message um, once they once they take a look. All right, so the refund page, um, now that we've got this loaded, again, we have um, sort of our basic information in this grid by default. If I open up one of these existing refunds, um, we can see this information um, is coming from these different fields on the refund record. And let's go ahead, let's add any one of these too. So again, we just do create to make a new one. Um, my refund number, again, I'm going to leave that blank. I have my date, and then I can um, enter my information if I just want to have um, basically a refund that I'm adding to the system. But if I want to have a check that goes with this, I would click this create a check um, checkbox. My check date, um, again, defaults, but I can update that if I need to. I can attach to the bank account. Um, if that's different than default, I would have an option to update that. And then I would select the vendor that I want to um, give this refund to. So once I selected my vendor, um, I just want to also note that this refund to updates to match the vendor, um, but I can still give it a description. And um, then I would go ahead and add my line item from here. and pick my account code. Again, I also I have that search, but I'm just going to pick one from the list this time. And um, then I will save this. So once I have the refund saved, um, I can clone it. Um, if I edit it, there are only certain fields I can edit. So let me wait till this finishes loading and then we'll take a look at that. Um, one of the things that you cannot edit once you create a refund is you can't add a check if it didn't already, if, like if you didn't add a check when you made the original refund, um, you can't edit to create a check um, and attach it on there. That is something that we have an issue for though to update in the future um, so that you know it may not always be the case. Um, but for the time being, if you need to reverse a refund, um, basically your process there is to um, add another refund with a negative amount to the same account. So that would basically counteract it, cancel it out, and then you could make a new refund um, or clone your original to create a refund with a check.
Um, but now we have this one that we, we did remember to make a check that, that time, right? So um, it doesn't have a check number yet, but we said that we wanted to create a check. Um, so now that we've done that, it is going to put it in our disbursements page. So the same place we went to um, after we um, processed our payables is the same page we go to for our refund and we can see here's my refund. It's got the refund type and amount. It's not printed yet. So if I wanted to, you know, use that show printable filter, I would be able to see this here and then um, generate a print file just like with my AP checks. Um, once I generate this, it would give me a file I could send to my um, third party printing or I could print that as a PDF um, and then it assigns it a check number. So here we go. All right. Um, let's see, so the next place we're going to go Um, let's, let's hop to the transfers advances. Let's get this one. Um, let's get, get through this one, I guess. Um, this page is, um, had some updates lately. So last week we did go over some of these on, um, the updates, uh, Fridays with fiscal. Um, Let's see here. So our basic grid shows us uh, the type we have, whether it's a transfer advance. Um, the classic transfer advance shows up for imported transactions if the um, account codes are um, were entered a certain way. So uh, generally there are specific account codes that are used for a transfer, specific ones that are used for an advance. Um, if they just use the standard codes in the right um, kind of grouping in classic, then it would still show transfer advance, but if they used a mix, then it could show this classic transfer advance. Um, it has the date, your description, and then you can actually see the accounts on the grid by default. One handy column on this is this repayable. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and move this over to my first column. Um, so this repayable flag would tell me for uh, an advance, you know, can I repay that? Is there still an amount um, that I can repay on? Um, as far as creating transactions, so if we open this up um, to make a new transaction here, I would designate at this point whether it should be a transfer or an advance. Um, if I'm entering a transfer, I would just enter the amount, again your date, and it didn't spell that right, but you know, we're just going to keep going. Uh, once I have this marked as a transfer transaction, when I choose the accounts, you can see in these descriptions even, um, all of these accounts are specific to transfers. I only have the option to choose the account, you know, if it's active, um, if it's got a valid start and stop date for the transaction date that I'm using, and um, also if it's the accurate code for um, a debit account related to a transfer. And then I would um, pick the um, amount that I'm transferring that to and save that and it would um, go ahead and, and move the money appropriately in the associated accounts. Uh, let's also create an advance real quick so we can take a look at the uh, um, related accounts there. Um, And now when I do this drop down, um, see I have advances. So this account um, specifically is coded to be um, an out account for um, my advances. Uh, 
Um, so certainly if um, you have districts that are saying that they um, aren't finding a specific account that they want in that drop down, the first thing I would check is that it's a valid code for which type they are trying to use. Um, they may need to create it on the account page if it doesn't exist. Um, if neither of those things are the case, then you'd want to check the start and stop dates there. Um, but let's go ahead. We'll save this up. And um, now that we have an advance, you'll notice that this looks a little bit different than when we saved the transfer. Um, the transfer kind of just had that basic info, um, but our advance has um, this grid at the bottom for repayments. So one of the things that we improved recently, um, you know, in classic, they would um, do that act mod, enter in, um, you know, where that trans that money was transferring to or from, but it didn't really link together um, in classic or even when we first kind of started in redesign, we had everything in the grid. Um, so it didn't specifically have those transactions where you could see the repayments in one place. So um, this is what this grid now does. Um, if I want to repay on this advance, We'll just click that plus right inside um, that advance and then I would be able to, um, it populates the amount. If I was only paying partial, I might update that. Um, and then I add my description and save. And then I can see my repayments um, right together with my advance information. If I didn't mean to repay that, I could always click this X and remove it. Um, the other thing with adding this though, so I mentioned that, you know, Classic didn't um, necessarily link those transactions. Um, so when um, you, maybe when you import your districts or if you have districts that are already um, in redesign, this could be done. Um, this can be done, you know, once basically ASAP, you know, when you have time um, is to go link the classic transactions. Um, and actually I opened one that was a new one. I want to find one of these legacies um, to go link the uh, classic repays to the advance. So let's actually, let's open up um, one of my imported transactions. And here I can see it had a, you know, a PO and a check number. So this was a legacy transaction. Um, and what I can see is that a repay was linked on here um, that would have been its classic uh, repay. But what I'm going to do is delete this so we can take a look at how that was done. All right. Um, so if you come in here, you haven't linked any of these classic repays, here's what you'll see is this link icon will be available. You would click this link and then um, you'd be able to locate the corresponding um, transaction, the repay, and then um, you'd be able to select that, click save, and that would link it. There is a report that helps you locate, you know, what, what the repay is, um, what the reference number is for that, and makes it a lot easier to link them. Um, so that's the transfer advanced activity report. And we do have a walkthrough for how to go about um, using that report, how to go about linking that in the appendix under useful procedures. So if that is something that um, you need to do that you're going to be doing for your districts um, and you want some more information, there's screenshots in there. It's kind of a step by step. So that is the route to go um, for some supporting documentation when you do that. All right, I know those transfers advances have uh, changed a bit recently. Um, that's probably, um, I don't know, one of the um, more complex pages, especially with what we have to go through um, for our remaining ones. So um, I'm just going to go ahead, stop and open it up and see if there are any, any questions at this point before we 
um, switch to the last two little pages we have here. Okay. Alrighty, so then uh, let's keep going. We're going to hit pending transactions. So what this page is for is um, when you have uh, transactions that are coming over from uh, the payroll side, um, when they're processing the um, um, employer retirement or the um, employer distributions, uh, when they're posting payroll, um, all of those um, transactions that are pushed over are connected to this pending transactions page. And then on the USAS side, you have the ability to review and either post or reject them from this page. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, we have a distribution, so it's an employer distribution file. And if we click this edit icon, we can open up the detail, um, see the accounts and the amounts that, it's, uh, that it would post. And then um, we have an option to post, reject, or we could validate this um, to see if it would give us any errors or any negative amounts if we posted it. Um, once I click post, it's going to give me a little pop-up here. So I do have an option to post a transaction date. Um, you know, maybe this was, um, maybe you're right around month end, and so you're, you know, the timing of your file, and then when you need to actually post it in USAS versus when it was created in USPS, um, you do have some control over when that transaction date is actually going to post, so that that doesn't throw off your month. Um, your like month to date totals. And then you do also have some options as far as um, selecting a payee vendor or um, you know, applying vendor information, um, name and address to the vendor in your USAS system. Um, or you can just go ahead and post that. And then um, for the distributions, what this will do is make a purchase order. And then the purchase order can be carried through that process that we just looked at. You could invoice the PO, post the payable, and make a check so that you can pay um, your board side. The other one that we have in here is a payroll file. So um, this looks just a little bit different. Um, still my same options to post, reject, or validate. Um, but when I post, I do have um, some different options here uh, because the payroll file, similar to Classic, it's going to take it right to the disbursement phase. It's skipping over um, some of those in steps in the middle with the purchase order um, and payables. So again, I have a transaction date. Um, since I'm going to a disbursement, I can pick if there's a specific bank account that I want that to be tied to. And then um, the option to post it as electronic, um, as basically like a, an electronic check. So um, when we've seen that before, that's saying, you know, is it going to be basically a memo transaction? If you want to be able to print a paper check for your payroll posting, um, or if your district wants to do that for their payroll posting, then they do want to uncheck this electronic checkbox before they um, post their payroll. Um, aside from posting these general files that come over from um, from payroll, uh, there is an import option. Right now that import option is specific to uh, receipts from a sequential file, so like a fixed format. Um, we have definitely had discussion about um, up upgrading this in the future to be able to import um, other types of files, import um, purchase orders, um, or to import spreadsheets like a CSV instead of that fixed file format. Um, so that's not available at this time, but um, our prioritization committee has discussed this a couple times recently as well. So um, that certainly is something that could be included in a future update.
All right. And um, we are uh, moving right along. We only have one more page to cover on this menu. So that is the distributions and error corrections. Um, so this is basically uh, your page that allows you to enter um, like correcting entries. So uh, let's just hop right into a uh, look at creating one of these. Um, again, I can assign a number or um, it would default. Um, so basically, if I wanted to um, change the, where the expenditure was charged, so say um, I accidentally you know, put a charge to the wrong account, but I don't really want to avoid the check. I just want to correct where that was um, charged to. Then I could um, enter this, yeah, put check account. Um, I could enter this uh, correcting entry instead, so this distribution error correction. Um, what I would do is come down here, and um, let's, Let's do a negative uh, 110 because that was the amount that I accidentally charged to this account. Um, and then I would come in here and put my, uh, my account that it actually should have been charged to and select that from my list. Um, then I could save this up. It does have to be equal to zero. So that's why I had my negative 110, my positive 110. I'm just correcting where it was. I'm not actually adding an expense. Um, you can see on my grid in the background here too, like I have all zeros. Um, so that's how you're able to um, correct those accounts um, with just a simple entry. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with this page that I wanted to note is um, the accounts. So you'll notice that I did just go ahead and use the drop down on this. This is the only page I believe with the accounts where we don't see uh, the magnifying glass search. And the reason for that is because this page is super unique in the fact that you could be typing in either an expense account, uh, an expenditure, or a revenue account. Um, so when I type this in, Um, this part, when I get to the third section of the account code, it could be either an object or a special cost center. So um, you'll notice this goes away when I start typing in the object. That's not a bug. It's just because it needs to know which type of account to continue on with. Um, so if you do ever run into questions on that, um, that is okay. That's normal. And it basically needs to be able to do that so that it you know, can account for um, both of those different kinds of codes. And I probably should have looked up a revenue code so we could look at that. But um, you know, if there's um, a correction that they need to do to revenue accounts, just know that that would work in here as well. And you know, if um, they ever need to like, look up the account, um, you know, say they're in here and they start this and then they realize they're not sure, um, your go-to trick is opening this second tab um, and then coming in, you know, and looking up uh, the account to put in there. So some options to get around that if uh, that does come up. Okay. Alrighty, so yeah, those are all my notes for this page. Um, we made it through quite a bit today. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of impressed. We actually um, still have some time so we can wrap it up early, um, but I'm going to open it up one more time. If there are any other questions you guys have about anything that we covered today, please let me know. Hi, Amanda. I'm oh, sorry. You are, I was helping somebody um, here when you were going over um, the activity ledger and mm -hmm. I just want to verify um, when you are do when we're when the districts are looking at that is that only information that has been inputted since they've gone live like since they've started um, inputting information or would that be or would or should that be before then as well 
It is. It will be um, any of the transactions that came over in uh, from their classic system. It's not just stuff from when they went live. So um, okay. So it should be stuff that's come over from classic as well. Because I was yeah. looking at at a district and it doesn't have their classic stuff. So. Um, I'm just wondering what might be the problem there. Okay. I would check. Yeah, I would check. Um, if you go, yeah, um, basically when it, this activity ledger does post, um, it posts all the transactions when you import them. So if you just imported them, um, it may be an issue of just basically that not information not posting or not completing. Um, there is a way to reset that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and show it. We're, we're not going to go too far into the um, configuration, okay. but here's what to try, okay? Configuration, okay. this activity ledger configuration, mm -hmm. check this box to repost, and then try and reset the instance. Okay. And then see if they load in there. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. No problem. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So I have a couple other questions. Is there a limit to characters in the invoice field? Uh, yes, I believe it is nine digits. And if they exceed, then it would give them a, um, an error um, when they saved. So it will let them know. Um, and also, can you use XREF accounts for receipts and RECs and POs? Uh, that is a good question. I know you can um, include the XREF in there, but I don't know that I've specifically tried it. I feel like you should, but let's go let's go ahead and try. Just gonna edit this first one here. Oh, we probably should make this active. And let's go into um, actually make a purchase order because I know we definitely looked at those purchase orders and converting. Um, but since we're going to run a test on this anyways, um, you know, if you have districts that don't use requisitions or, you know, maybe there are certain situations where they just want to create a purchase order um, without having to do the requisition, they can just create a new purchase order uh, right from this grid as well. Yeah, and I think that was our account, right? So I typed in X test. Let's go. I should have definitely looked at the account, huh? I think it's a good sign because it was right at the top. So 110 with the OPU of 101. Yep, so there's our account. So I just typed in X test right into that charges drop down and it does use the XREF. Um, let's go test our receipts as well. Um, and we get to see this revenue grid. This gives us a reason to kind of take a look here um, real quick at the revenue accounts as well. Uh, so let's pick our first one. All right, and we'll go to our receipt grid real quick. Yep, so both the receipts and um, Rex and POs, your XREF accounts will work. You just type your XREF right into 
um, that account drop down. If we look at the search, the XDRF code is available in here too. So either way, um, users would feel comfortable using those codes. They will work. All right, well, I'll hang out for another minute if there are additional questions. Um, but that pretty much uh, wraps us up for today with what we wanted to cover. Um, tomorrow, again, we'll be starting at 9 a.m. Um, we're going to start right off with uh, budgeting, and then Michelle is also going to be talking about the periodic, extract, and um, system menu items. So, um, yeah, we will. Uh, pick back up then. And then, yeah, day three, basically reports and utilities. Um, reports are pretty heavy, so we'll probably be on that for most of the day. Um, and then just any other miscellaneous items um, at the end to wrap it up. So uh, thank you all for logging in today, and uh, we'll, we'll maybe see you tomorrow. Um, but hope everyone is uh, doing well. All right, have a good day.